How many of you have seen the 1993 movie Schindler's List? Oh, good, quite a few have. And uh, for those of you who haven't, it was based on the story of Oscar Schindler. And he was a uh, German businessman who had arranged to save some 1,100 plus Jews during the Holocaust period of the um, Poland country. And when the uh, Germans had occupied Poland during World War II, they had taken control of all of the manufacturing facilities in Poland. And Schindler, in his capacity as a trustee, had taken over a couple of factories just outside of Krakow that produced uh, kitchenwares. And it was shortly after that that he converted some of these factories over to producing uh, ammunition shells for the uh, German Nazi party. And of course, this had classified them as essential for the war, war effort. And Schindler, uh, by bribing some of the higher officials over time, would be able to set apart a part of the concentration camp, which was in Krakow, Poland, to house the Jews that were working in his factory. And this would give them protection from some of the guards in the Krakow concentration camp that were very mean and, and cruel. And so he was able to protect some 1,100 Jews in this portion of the camp and they were known as Schindler's Jews and they would be also known as uh, essential workers for the war effort and this would uh, protect them from being shipped off to some of the other concentration camps where many of the Jews were put to death. And before the war was over he would be arrested for bribery and he had spent his entire fortune helping his Jews. He never recovered the wealth that he had gathered during the war. As a matter of fact, he often had to rely upon the generosity of those Jews that he had helped during the war for his own survival. He ended up dying penniless.ly And so, because of his efforts, he was able to save the lives of over 1,100 plus Jews. And so, is it any wonder why he was still and considered a hero of the people, of the Jewish people, even in Israel today, because of all the things that he had done for them during the war? But he was an unlikely hero because Schindler was born a German. He had become part of the Nazi party. He was a profiteer who had gained great fortune during the war, his factories had belonged to Jewish people before the Germans had took them over, and he amassed a great deal of wealth. Schindler also took part in many black tearing activities in order to accumulate even greater wealth. And although he was married, he was also known for womanizing and excessive drinking. And in the beginning of the war, he exploited the Jews and his factories in order to accumulate his fortune. And so uh, the author of the book, which would later become the movie Schindler's List, wrote that what attracted him to Schindler's story was the fact that you couldn't say where opportunism ended and altruism began. In Schindler's case, goodwill emerged from the most unlikely places. And Oscar Schindler was clearly a flawed human being, yet no one could deny the good that he had accomplished, whatever his motives had been at the time. And Samson, one of Israel's judges, was a lot like that. He was a flawed man, but would turn out to be one of the greatest heroes in the Old Testament, yet one of the most unlikely. See, the story of Samson is found in Judges chapters 13 through 16. And there is more written about Samson as a judge than any of the other judges except for Samuel. 
And he was born to previously childless uh, couples that were informed by the angel of the Lord that they would have a son and that he would be a Nazarite and that he would take the Nazarite vows. And a Nazarite was a person who was called holy unto the Lord. And we read about that in Numbers chapter 6 and verse 8. He was to be consecrated unto the Lord. He was to serve the Lord. And that's what the Nazarites did. And there were basically two types of Nazarite. There was a Nazarite for a period of time. And that was a person who could take a vow that would be for maybe a week, two weeks, maybe a month, maybe a year, whatever period of time they liked. But there was also a Nazarite for life. And that person would take his vows, they would do it uh, freely and willingly, and that would, they would remain that for the rest of their lives. But Samson was an exception because he was chosen by God to be a Nazarite from his birth until his death. And John the Baptist was also a Nazarite under the same type of conditions. There were three stipulations to being a, a Nazarite that we read about in Numbers chapter 6. The first one is that they could not have anything to do with the fruit of the vine. They were not to eat the grapes. They were not to even eat raisins. They were not to drink of, its fru uh, of the wine of it, its, uh, its fruit juice, whether fermented or unfermented. They could not touch dead bodies. And this was kind of an important type of thing uh, when it pertained to the Jews because it was a custom that when someone had died in their family that it was the immediate members that would prepare their bodies for burial. But as a Nazarite, they were not allowed to touch dead things or even dead animals. And they were not to cut their hair while they were in the mode of being a Nazarite under that vow. Those who were a Nazarite for a short period of time after their uh, period of being a Nazarite was over with, they could then cut their hair. But in Samson's case, he was never to cut his hair. And so, what were some of the big problems that we find in Samson's life? Well, he may have systematically broken every stipulation of his Nazarite vow. Now, it's not specifically stated that he had drank any wine, but he certainly partied a lot. And on those occasions, he was often very much out of control. So there are those who speculate that he might have been drinking and that's what caused him to act inappropriately. He also killed a lion with his bare hands. Now, killing the lion in, its, in and of itself was not a sin. What resulted in a sin on his part was sometime later on when he went by that carcass, the lion that he had killed, uh, honeybees had occupied that carcass. And so he opened up that carcass and removed its honey, therefore touching a dead thing, once again breaking his vows. And then he yielded to the wiles of Delilah when she had his head shaved when he was a asleep and he lost his strength. Now some people believe that the strength of Samson was in his hair and that's not true. Samson received his strength from God and his hair was just part of the vow that he would keep and it was as though it was the final straw in which he broke those three vows and therefore God removed his strength. And not only did he break the Nazarite vows but he also broke laws that pertain to those which were handed down by God through Moses. And we read about those laws in Leviticus and the book of Deuteronomy as well, where they, in other places, where they were not to marry foreign wives. And yet, Samson married a Philistine woman over even the objection of his own parents. He had a violent temper. At his long wedding feast, now the wedding feast lasted seven days. Can you imagine going to a wedding reception that lasted seven days? Well, anyhow, it lasted seven days. And at this feast, he had proposed to 30 men there, Philistine men, that if they could solve a riddle for him, they would, he would give them each a change of garments. But if they could not figure out his riddle, they were to give, each of them were to give him a 
change of garments. And so about the third day, the men had figured out that they weren't going to be able to figure out this riddle. And so they went to his wife and convinced her that she had to go to Samson to find out what the answer of the riddle was. And they did so by telling her that if she didn't do this, they were going to kill her and her family. And so starting on the third day, she begins talking to Samson, trying to get the answer to the riddle out of him, and he wouldn't give it to her. He didn't give it to her for all, until the seventh day. My guess is that he just got fed up of listening to her plea for the answer to the riddle that he gave it to her. Well, she immediately goes out and tells the 30 Philistine men. And so when Samson calls the men in to answer his riddle, they give him the answer. He knew immediately that he had been duped and he became very angry at his wife's betrayal and then he goes out and immediately kills 30 men for their clothing in order that he may pay off his bet. He was basically out of control and he did not use good judgment. We also find that Samson had a weakness for women, especially Philistine women. In addition to his wife, he took up with a prostitute in Gaza, and later he would take up with Jezebel, who certainly did not have his best interest in heart. And three times she tried to find out from him what it was that gave him his strength. And after finding out what it was, she betrayed him as well, and he became a captive to the Philistines. He also was extremely brash and self-sufficient. Unlike the other judges, when they would have to face the enemies of God, they would put together, they would gather some men together, they put together an army, and then go fight the battles. Samson didn't do this. He was a, a one-man war. When he went to the Philistines, he fought them by himself and killed hundreds of them. As a matter of fact, on many occasions, the only reason why he went to war with them was because of some personal reason, something they had done to him that upset them, upset him, and so therefore he would go to war with them. And so he wasn't a strategist, he was more reactionary. And through all of this, he was still able to help Israel through some very difficult times in this era. He uh, also displayed poor judgment throughout his life. He was the epitome of Proverbs, chapter 25 and verse 28, where it says, a man without self-control is like a city without walls. A man without self-control is like a city without walls. You see, walls are a defensive barrier. They're there to protect you. Our government probably do well to read this verse to understand what the purpose of a wall is. But anyhow, the wall is a defensive thing. He says, a man without self-control is like a city without walls. Why? Because if you're defenseless, eventually you're going to fall. And just as a city would fall, it would be inevitable that Samson would also fall because of his lack of self-control. And that's exactly what happened to him. And so, he was an unlikely hero. But make no mistake about it, he was a hero. He judged Israel for 20 years and kept their enemies, the Philistines, at bay. And at, time, and at that time, when there seemed to be no one else that would be able to help Israel through their difficult times, he was there to help them. And after he was captured by the Philistines, when he was being displayed for the amusement of his captors in the temple of Dagon, their God, he prayed to God for strength and he literally brought the house down on him. You remember the story, he's led into the temple of Dagon by a boy. And he says to the, to the young man, he gives him instructions to bring him to the two pillars in the building in order that he might rest upon them. You see, he had to have been led there because when he was captured, the Philistines had gouged out his eyes and he didn't know where they were and had to be led to the pillars. And in the temple that day when they were there, there were 3,000 people. And I can only imagine as they were in this arena looking down on Samson and 
the middle of the building. They were probably laughing and, and jeering at him. When all of a sudden he gave one huge push and those pillars came down along with the roof, killing all 3,000 people that were in the temple along with destroying the temple of Dagon, their God. We're told that the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him to defeat them even as he himself was dying. And then there's that interesting verse that we read in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 32. You know, Hebrews chapter 11, the great hall of faith. There in that chapter, we read about the great faiths of Noah, Abraham, Moses, and David. And then the writer says in the 32nd chapter, for time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson. And all of a sudden we begin to think, what, Samson? Samson is in the hall of faith? This man who was out of control, who used such poor judgment throughout his entire life, is in Hebrews chapter 11? Well, he's listed there among the Hebrews, the, the heroes of faith, because he not only exemplifies God's ability to work through a badly flawed person, but his willingness, but God's willingness to do so. And Samson demonstrates the grace of God. And there is no other way to explain the fact that a wild man such as Samson, one who had broken every detail of his vow and how he, uh, the vows in which he was supposed to live under could be used by God to serve him and his people. And this is grace. He was a recipient of the grace of God. Now the reason for this lesson isn't an encouragement to be like Samson, thinking that God will use you and can work through you no matter how out of control you may be in your life or how disobedient you may be. That's not the idea nor the point of this lesson. So what can we learn from Samson? Well, first of all, Samson brought a lot of hardship uh, upon himself by being so out of control. He made foolish vows. He made foolish decisions. And he made foolish life choices, all of which predicted basically what the results would be. He should have known better when he had married the Philistine woman that it wasn't going to turn out right for him. He should have known that when he took up with the prostitute in Gaza that that wasn't going to turn out right for him. He should have known when he had taken up with uh, Delilah that it wasn't going to work out well for him there either. And so, secondly, we have to imagine that God would surely have done even more through him had he been more obedient. And let me tell you something about obedience that a lot of people never seem to understand. A lot of people think that obedience is knuckling under the will of God because if you don't, that somehow God will punish you or crush you. And that's not the case. Obedience is the way for us to open up ourselves up to God so that he can work through our lives. Obedience is the way we open our lives so we can receive the blessings that God has for us. And that's why God tells us to to be obedient because he knows that if we follow his will and when we open up ourselves to the way of, of living our lives according to his will that when we open ourselves in that way that he is able to bless us and that's what obedience is all about think how much more he could have done in Samson's life had he had been more obedient but instead he had closed himself off to all the possibilities that God could have done through him. What we should learn from Samson's life is this, 
not to rule out anyone, including ourselves, as potential service to accomplish God's will. Based on Samson's example, we shouldn't look at anybody and say, no way that God could ever use that person. Or to think or even say that that person couldn't be used by the Lord. Or to think about a person's life that they are so messed up or that person's life is so deteriorated or that person is so disobedient that God can't possibly do anything in the life of that person. Everyone is flawed in some way or another. We all have imperfections and we all have limitations. Look at David and his sin, especially those that had to do with Beersheba. And yet, look how God used him. Elijah, one of God's greatest prophets, and yet he became frightened and discouraged by the threatenings of Jezebel and her th and he thought, as a matter of fact, when he fled from her and in hiding, he thought he was the only person left faithful to God in the entire world. But God didn't give up on him because of his fears and discouragement. Before Paul, the apostle, gave his life to spreading the gospel throughout the Mediterranean world, he was Saul of Tarsus, who breathed out threatenings and slaughter against the people of God. Paul also wrote to young Timothy, not to let anyone despise you because of your youth. And Timothy was also a very timid young man. And yet Paul had this to say about him in Philippians chapter 2, verse 20. I have no one else like him. You've heard this before, but I'd certainly like for you to take this to heart. God works through imperfect people because that's the only kind of people he has to work with. It's the only kind that there are. And so he's going to work through people who are imperfect. Yet the church has sometimes been described as a vast unemployed army with only a small percentage of its ranks willing to serve. And why is that? Well, I think it's because many of us look at ourselves and we think we're too limited or we're too flawed or we're too weak or we're too insignificant or that we're too sinful or we're something else for God to have any use for us and we just take ourselves off of the active roster. But the truth of the matter is is that God can work through us and that he has work for us to do and that we have to be in the game. The scriptures tell us that God has given each of us a gift to use in his service. And you really can't deny that because scripture says it. And it's up to us to find out what those gifts and what those abilities are and how we may be able to use them in serving God and his people. And none of us are exceptions to the rules because he has given to us, each of us, a gift to use in his service. God has work for you and me because he is the God of grace. We don't deserve to be his servant any more than Samson did. Yet, he promised that if we're willing, he's able. So, here's the question. How do we become servants by God's grace? Well, let me make a few suggestions to you. First of all, think of yourself as raw materials in the hands of a master workman. Don't think about what you are, but think about what you can become. Recognize that your ability to serve isn't by your power, but rather by the power of God. Think of yourself as a lump of clay, like the song that we sang just before the lesson in the hands of a master potter and that he's the master workman and he will make you into what he chooses if you will yield to his will. Secondly, be obedient in order to maximize your potential. You see, the greatest tragedy of Samson's life is 
is that he had so much great potential that was never realized because he was so disobedient. Saul of Tarsus, who becomes the Apostle Paul when he was describing the aftermath of his experience on the road to Damascus when Christ had appeared to him, relates this event in Acts chapter 20 and verses, uh, 20, chapter 26 and verses 19 and 20. Therefore, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem and throughout all the regions of Judea and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds and keeping with their repentance. And so what Paul is saying, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but I started to do things right away. And so if you're not doing what you know God would have you to do, that is, if you're not worshiping, you're not praying, or you're not immersing yourself in his word, not caring for others, start doing it. Be obedient to God and God will maximize your potential. Thirdly, do what Samson did, pray. And here's probably one of the things that Samson got right. When he knew he had the opportunity to stand against the enemies of God, he used his strength for good. He prayed to God to give him a blessing and God did so. And you can do the very same thing. Pray, ask God to use you, ask him to empower you for whatever it is that you have the opportunities and gifts to do in his name. And fourthly, be great, grateful for God's grace in being willing to work through you as weak and flawed as you are, as weak and as flawed as we all are. In fact, that's a great place to start. Give thanks to God for his grace. Tell him you believe in him when he says he's willing to work through flawed and unlikely people. And ask him to work through you. Who knows? You may become an, an, an unlikely hero as well. And so the lesson is yours this morning. And if you have any need, if you're not a Christian and you'd like to know what you need to do to be a Christian, feel free to talk to us afterwards and we'll tell you how you need to believe and to repent and to confess and to be baptized for the remission of your sins. If you're already a Christian but have needs or prayers of the congregation, come while together we stand and sing the invitation song. <laughs>